What are some of the misconceptions that we see within our industry? I have been working with Bones for the last eight years, and within my time in the industry, I often see mistakes that commonly happen on a day-to-day -day basis. So for today's video, I wanted to cover some of the easy misconceptions or mistakes I see within the bone industry. Over the last five years, I've made tons of mistakes myself when looking at skeletal pieces, trying to figure out the history and provenance of all of these remains because there isn't much information for people online to really look at. It's okay to make mistakes in this industry as long as you learn from them and move forward from there. Today, let's go over some of the common mistakes that I've seen when working with human remains within the industry. So the first biggest mistake that I see is people not knowing the difference between hands and feet. To some watching, it might seem extremely obvious, but I see it happen every day within forums and different groups online. And that in itself is completely fine. I remember when I first studying bones, I got them confused too. But here are some things that might be able to help you differentiate from one to the other. The first thing is bones in the hand actually have 27 individual bones and bones in the feet are 26. So that's the first indicator is just counting how many you see. But the most obvious sign between differentiating is the calcaneus bone or the heel bone right here. That immediately tells you what you're working with. So when you're looking at the different tarsals and metacarpals within the hands and feet, they actually look very different when you have them complete, but where I see people making a lot of mistakes is when the back parts of both the hands and feet are missing and you only have the bottom parts here. So the biggest thing to look at is the toe bone because that immediately differentiates it between the hands and the feet. Now, if you found this video interesting, be sure to like and subscribe for more. We work really hard on these videos and bringing you public and accessible information, so be sure to do that. Now let's talk about the second mistake that I see a lot in the industry. Size isn't everything. Well, you know, sometimes it is. When looking at the biological profile of an individual, unless you have the entire skeleton to look at, you can't always speak in absolutes when determining the biological sex or age of an individual. Oftentimes I see people making mistakes when referencing the size of a skull in relation to if it is a biological female or when defining the age of the individual. Here's a perfect example. When looking at this demonstrative skull, it's extremely small compared to other demonstrative skulls that we've seen. So oftentimes people make the assumption, oh, it must be a child skull because it's so small or oh, it has characteristics of being biologically female because of the size, and this always isn't true. People come in all different shapes and sizes throughout the world, so assuming the size of a skeleton or skull in relation to the individual's biological profile or age cannot always be done. Here is an example on the other end of the spectrum. This is an incredibly large demonstrative skull. And here you can see the real difference between the larger skull and the smaller skull. So people might say, ah, this must be a male skull because it's so large and robust, but we've actually seen female skulls that are over six foot tall that are the same size. So you cannot always make that differentiation based on size or shape. On the same token, pediatric skulls are typically smaller, but there are also small people in the world. So I just really wanted to reaffirm this point that size doesn't always matter. And there are other characteristics that come into identifying biological profiles or ages of an individual. But this is a second mistake that I see so often within the industry. Now, how do we actually figure out the information? When looking at this pediatric spine, you can actually tell that it is of a young individual because the sacrum actually hasn't fused yet. Now, when we look at this spine here, it was relatively the same size as the first spine, but the sacrum is fully fused. That would indicate that this individual was just a little bit shorter, but not actually younger. So looking at how the bones fuse and the different developmental stages in which they fuse could indicate age, but this isn't the case. You'd never just want to use one method in order to say this is or isn't something. So we always want to use a variety of different methods and factors to indicate someone's biological profile or their age. So in plain English, both of these spines are the same height. If you were to just go by size, which is what I see happen a lot, both of these individuals would be the same age. When in reality, this one, the sacrum isn't fused yet, and this one it is, and that would indicate that this person was a lot older, but just shorter, where this person actually was younger. So there are different methods to figuring out the age of an individual, but you cannot always use size as an indicator. For instance, you can use Joseph Hefner's method, who was well known for using methods of figuring out ancestry of the skull, 
but you would look at the brow ridge, the mandible, and the different parts of the skull in order to figure out a better understanding of the biological profile. So to hit it home, the size of the skull or the size of the skeleton is not always indicative of the individual's biological sex or age. Now let's talk about the third mistake I see so often. Did the teeth fall out anti-mortem or post-mortem? Since so many of these skulls were used in universities and educational institutions all over the world, the majority of these skulls have traded thousands of hands before making its way to me. So oftentimes I see people make the mistake of saying that all the teeth fell out anti-mortem versus post-mortem. So the differentiation is anti-mortem is prior to death and post-mortem is after death. This ties into another topic, which is just the difference between anti-mortem damage and post-mortem damage. For instance, this skull here has post-mortem tooth loss, which means that the teeth fell out after the individual had passed away. We know this because when we look at the mandible, there are the footprints of where the teeth used to be or the holes in which the roots of the teeth used to go in still appear within the mandible. So if we look closely here, we can see all the points where the teeth used to go in and it hasn't healed over yet. So for instance, this individual lost all of their teeth anti-mortem. So when we look at the mandible of this skull compared to the first skull, the mandible is completely rounded and smoothed over and the little pores where the roots of the teeth would have stuck in have healed over. So this individual had lost all of their teeth while they were alive and their bone naturally healed. The biggest thing you wanna look for is just signs of healing within the bone to see if the teeth fell out before the individual passed away or after. Oftentimes they didn't properly secure the teeth with glue and as a response, so many teeth fell out after the skull was already cleaned and prepared. So this is a big differentiation that I wanted to make since I see it happen so often within the industry. This also ties in with anti-mortem versus post-mortem damage. Oftentimes we see people say, oh, this skull had a trauma from a battle ax or had a huge slice when really most likely the skull probably fell and the damage came after the fact. You wanna really look at how the cracks in the skull were made because it actually shatters and breaks differently when an individual is alive versus how the bone breaks after a skull has been perfectly cleaned and processed. There's a famous method of looking at how skulls actually break called the Lefort fractures, where there's different levels of how skulls actually break under trauma. And oftentimes this was done by an anatomist that actually took hundreds of human skulls and beat them with a baseball bat and drop them on the ground to see how the skull breaks in various different ways. And these techniques are actually used a lot in orthopedics and different bone reconstruction surgeries to deal with trauma as well as solve different issues within the skull. But with that, there are different traumas that happen within the individual when they are still alive versus after the skull has already been cleaned and processed. So you really have to look at the nuances of how the bone is broken to be able to determine if it happened after the individual passed away or before. If the teeth fell out after the skull was already prepared, then the roots would still remain there and it wouldn't heal. But if the tooth fell out while the individual was alive, the bone would heal over. So this is a simple mistake that I see happen a lot within the industry is people say, oh, this individual lost all of their teeth when they were alive, when really the skull was just missing the teeth after the bone was already cleaned. But probably when the skull was first cleaned, all the teeth was there. But just over all of the years of people studying and working with the skull, the teeth went missing over time. So the next mistake comes with dating the skeleton and bones in general. This is probably the most common mistake that I see all the time. But I've seen so many instances where people say this skeleton is from the Victorian era or this skeleton is 500 years old. And unfortunately, most of the time that just isn't true. The only way to know if it is actually from the period that you claim it to be is if you have source documents to prove what you are saying. For example, this human femur was stamped Clay Adams, New York. So here we have a date and a period in history in which we can put this femur. For instance, in the 70s, Clay Adams moved to New Jersey. And from then on, all of the pieces that they produced were stamped Clay Adams, New Jersey. So we know for a fact this piece was produced before the 70s 
piece, where we actually have a timeline in which this piece existed. In. The next thing is actually source documents. Unless you have an original source document that actually has the piece in question in the catalog, that is another way that you can definitively say what period this piece is from. Someone's story is just that, a story. You need both real life evidence to prove your claim. We had a Clay Adams skeleton that dated back to 1940. And when we purchased it, we were actually told that it was acquired by a physician in the 40s who was the individual's father. And then from there, it was eventually passed on down to the son and he no longer wanted to keep it and we were able to acquire it for the showroom. So here we have a date, 1940. Then from there, we were able to find a catalog that actually had this exact skeleton preparation on display. And that catalog was dated back to the 40s. So there we had a validation, the original owner's testimony of where the piece came from, and then a piece of source material that was able to actually verify the piece itself. But unless there's an original maker's mark, seal, stamp, or anything that can actually say the company that produced it, you have to be very careful when making claims of where the piece came from. I feel within this line of work, oftentimes the subject matter is extremely heavy. And when you're working with the unknown, it's very easy to say, ah, oh, this was Matilda, a prostitute from the 1920s that was ran over by a bus. What do you mean by that? That's what I always hear. That's that's one of my favorite stories that I heard. But within this line of work, oftentimes the skulls don't have a history associated with, or it might be unknown. So it's completely human to try to figure out the history. I just wanted to make sure in the purpose of this video that we provide as much accurate information so you guys can better figure out where these pieces come from and how to identify them when you find a skull. This is another common mistake I see, and it's one of the most simplest ones to fix, but it's the difference between antique versus modern hardware. Now, once again, there are exceptions to every rule, so this isn't always applied to every skull, but it is a good rule of thumb to follow. Within the majority of the skeletons that we've seen within the market, once you get to around 1960, they begin to use stainless steel. Before that, they use brass in a lot of the articulations. So if you see stainless steel, it is either a vintage skull or a modern skull and if you see brass hardware it's most likely an antique skull looking at between the 1920 to 1950 and then stainless steel was used from the 60s onwards so there are exceptions but this is just a very simple rule that you can stick to and you'll be right 99% of the time there are different exceptions for example Wolfgang was a German preparator that made different skulls within the 40s to the 50s and they use stainless steel so there are small batch preparators that would make their own cuts and alterations to the skull. And this could be an exception to the rule. But the majority looking at material history, this is a constant transition that we've seen is skeletons going from copper and brass to eventually stainless steel. Especially within the videos where we looked at the skeleton wall, primarily focusing on the oldest skeletons, the modern ones, you can really see how the material transformed from copper and brass to stainless steel. Now this next mistake is a little bit harder to spot, but I wanted to make you guys aware of it. And it's the difference between reproductions and authentic skeletal preparations. For instance, when we look at this exploded skull, it has all the indicators of what authentic French preparations look like of exploded skulls. So one would assume this was prepared by Vester Tremont or Auxus or some of the historic bone companies that used to do this style of preparation. But this one is in fact what would be considered a reproduction. So it is an authentic exploded skull and it is using real bones, but this was not an antique piece made by the historic company, but a modern piece that was made in the style of the antique preparations by a local preparator. This exploded skull was created by the artist Sick Art, who actually made this preparation paying homage to some of the old antique methods. Now, I had actually made this mistake when I first started collecting exploded skulls. I purchased one that I thought was created in 1920, but actually the disarticulated skull itself was created and disarticulated in 1920, but the metal working was a modern preparation that was patinaed down to look antique. This is an authentic German-made Samso exploded skull by the company Samso. Now this one actually comes with the original stamp that was produced by the company, so this would be considered an authentic exploded skull. In the world of preparations, there are reproductions that are made that are still considered authentic, but they are not original to the company itself. 
and then there are historic preparations. So that's a key differentiation that I wanted to make to anyone watching at home. Now, antique versus modern preparations do not necessarily affect the value. I have some exploded skulls that were made by modern preparators that are actually worth more than antique preparations. So it's not about the value, but it's just more about knowing what you're purchasing. Personally, I love all types of skeletal preparations and within the showroom we have a combination of both but i wanted to make you guys aware that there are some that are modernly reproduced comparatively to old antique pieces and there you have it guys there are some of the common mistakes that i see on a day-to-day -day basis within the industry i myself i'm always learning and every time i make a mistake i try my best to correct it and figure out why i made that mistake and I just feel like there isn't enough information online publicly of people talking about the skeletal bone trade and how we can learn from it. If you guys found this interesting, be sure to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel and make sure to tune in for the next video. Ciao everyone.